Chastity is a subversive and thoughtful rock and roll band and the music-making moniker for a young person named Brandon Williams, who lives in Whitby, which is a working-class city just east of Toronto, Ontario. After playing shows and putting out a tape, a 7-inch, and an EP, Chastity's debut album was released on July 13th, 2018. It's called Deathlust and is available around the world via Captured Tracks and Royal Mountain Records. Brandon stopped by my house recently and we had a frank and heavy conversation about music, Whitby, punk rock, MySpace, drug abuse, and how illness is stigmatized and neglected in some sectors of society, suicide, anxiety, and we talked about other things as well. With in-kind support from Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph, Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton, and Planet of Sound locations in Ottawa and Toronto, and, of course, listeners like you who make flexible monthly pledges at patreon.com slash Control, or subscribe to this podcast and download episodes. This is the 411th episode of Creative Control, featuring Chastity with your host, me, Vish Khanna. Hey, Brandon. Welcome to my home. Thank you. Thanks for coming all the way from Toronto. Hey, no worries. Now, I need to ask you a question right away. What do you make of our home? I just, uh, what, what would you change about it? What would you do? I think you're good. A lot of, how many CDs do you figure you have? Well, this is from a bygone era, obviously. I don't know exactly how many CDs are there. Uh, you, you must keep in mind that I'm a, I have been for some time a print journalist. So I get, I used to get sent CDs mm. regularly. This is not all money spent right uh and i didn't like a lot of people i didn't get uh, I, I actually did not get rid of them because my car still has a cd player right. and my son and i when i want to put some music on we just we use the cd player because i don't have a very good whatever bluetooth or wireless system that works so they actually still come in handy you know i if you go to the, my office you will see almost as many records, but mm. I have CDs, yeah, and people remark upon them, and I don't, you know, we're trying to get the house in order. I have not yet thought that I might get rid of them altogether. I'm seeing Mets. Yes, there's some, yes, that's right. There, It's all alphabetical and chronological. Whoa. So if you're in the M's, yes, you would see Mets, yeah. So alphabetical <laughs> and then chronological when it when by the band by, like oh, okay like if a band, oh, yeah. I, I chronological see. and the band's discography yeah mm. I, I they used to be my children have particularly the bottom three shelves are probably all out of order they oh, grab right. them and move them around or they used to my son mostly i don't think my daughter did much of that to be honest but my son was uh, instantly drawn to them and would pull them out so like <laughs> i'm sure the nirvana section down at the bottom is all right the noah 23 sections all confused there's just a few sections that are probably out of order but i stand by what i said it's mostly yeah most, and you can see it's overflowing like i there's still occasionally cds that come into the house from through the mail and i've talked about this on the show my son and i will assess them by just sticking them in the car and deciding if we like them wow and then he decide he is actually determined guests on the show wow yeah, it's critic. He's a critic, absolutely. Yeah, he's like, I don't think you should have these people on. Uh, <laughs> I don't think this is worth it. So, right. yeah. Anyway, I I do appreciate, and, and just so uh, people know, it's like thirty five degrees Celsius. Mm. We're Western, in a heat wave. We're in a heat wave that won't stop. So if you hear, um, I have a, a fan. We don't have AC here in our. We have many CDs, but we don't have AC. <laughs> so I have a fan going. If you hear like a little ambient. People can hear that a little bit of air circulating. Is that is that is it? Are you feeling that air? It's nice. Okay, it's good. So tell me about uh, your 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 band Chastity and and your. I know this is my understanding anyway. Is that it's this is you. This is really mm -hmm. an expression of of you. You have a band, but like yeah. a lot of this is coming right from you, right? Yeah, it's just something. I mean, I had tons of lyrics written first yeah, and yeah. i think i just sort of tackled it and gave the lyrics a home in chastity and yeah started just like a few years ago and have just been doing it and playing shows and have been fortunate to play some like good shows and and 
do some touring and stuff with it but yeah it started just like it's like a home. let's figure these lyrics like yeah, yeah it's like, like a bedroom sort of project right more or less yeah it's definitely written like sort of in that i mean especially lyrically i spend so much time in my bedroom yeah <laughs> so yeah, yeah. it's like sort of written and i think it comes across that way you can sort of hear it but then it's like sort of put in this grandiose sort of home in ways with the music so yeah you're from been, are you from whitby ontario from whitby which yeah. is just east of toronto yeah yeah uh, where do you live now whitby you, live, s- in you whitby. live in whitby yeah okay yeah you live like with your parents yeah okay how's that oh it's okay yeah it's fine i think yeah I've, j- I've just been like i went to school in in hamilton and stuff and then i started just started this sort of at the tail end of of school and and got it going and i've just been touring and stuff and so i think living living in whitby has been it's been okay like it's been and it's inspired a lot of stuff to be honest it's sort of like a mundane it's no guelph to be honest you know it's like not yeah yeah, whitby is like pretty monoculture and it's working class place yes it is yeah it's like oshawa it's a suburb really of oshawa right uh and oshawa has sort of been going through some changes and gm plant going downhill and Mm -hmm. just some like challenges and and whatever but whitby whitby largely is like a bedroom community though too Mm -hmm. like it's people sleep there and then they go into toronto (laughs) right or they go into osho maybe so it's not that unusual like i you know i always i'm always um often when people are sitting in my living room for the show it's because they're touring and they're from away and they they happen to be in the area so they come and drop by here but you actually made a trek from whitby and i assume I was in Hamilton last night. Oh, you were in Hamilton last yeah, night. Okay. Well, yeah. still, you, you, I think you're probably used to driving around mm-hmm. to get out of Whitby to meet people a little bit, right? Yeah. To find culture and yeah. connect with people. Yeah. And I think, I think Whitby, for me, like I had the dungeon. I don't know if you remember yeah, the dungeon. Yeah, dungeons. the venue. Yeah, yeah. I played there. Did you? I played there a few times. Yeah. Sick. Yeah. What'd you think? Oh, it was fine. Yeah. Well, I mean, we had good experiences there. We played a christmas or new year's eve show or something with cuff the duke once sick this sorry this is in oshawa right is, yeah, yeah, yeah 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 and then yeah we played there with other other people uh, yeah and it was fine yeah uh, i heard there was some sketchiness later or maybe even during during and then switched owners luckily right. so right. there were some drugs and stuff wasn't yeah. it? yeah drug dealing yeah. yeah yeah but then the city of oshawa like then this guy will like a really cool person solid person came in and was the second owner of it and um did a great job but the city of oshawa just the municipality was like they're just going through a sort of war on drugs of their own we have that in guelph too yeah yeah i've often heard that that area oshawa whitby is a bit rough for that stuff was it a rough upbringing like were you in well oshawa i've definitely got I mean, I've got friends that face that stuff still. And Mm. and in Oshawa, it's like we were taught in an assembly at Anderson Collegiate, my (laughs) high school once, that uh, Oshawa had the highest HIV AIDS rate per capita in North America. Really? Yeah. And so I think it's been through, I think the crisis, to be honest, still exists in parts and, Mm. and drugs. And but I think ultimately just hurt people you know and like people trying their best and finding drugs you know and and so i think oshawa anyway was going through this and needed a sort of scapegoat Mm -hmm. needed and and found these scapegoats in these certain areas and started dinging which to me like the dungeon was sanctuary for me and my friends some of my best friends still i met at the dungeon like um i've never heard of a dungeon being a sanctuary but that's yeah that's how bad it might have been right yeah but it was good like the dungeon was a good thing and and even among that like owner i mean he wasn't solid the first owner at all like the second owner was and they just started dinging him the municipality started dinging him with noise oh violations and they just rang up i think to like around five thousand dollars and he just had to call it but it was a loss for the city it was a loss for like 
Whitby has 10 hockey arenas. Like yeah. Whitby's population is 120,000. They have 10 hockey arenas and right. no all ages space, hmm. like community space for music or visual art or anything like, but they have 10 hockey arenas. And so this Durham, like Durham region, Durham region doesn't have a space really. And there's, so that's what I mean by monoculture. I mean, it's like yeah. totally like miss directed it's like missing a lot of people i think where the dungeon satisfied that and found these sort of like fringy kids or whatever you know sure. like yeah. found this place and found that sanctuary like i said like and just so i think yeah i i yeah were you ever a part of that sort of drug culture like did you avoid it did you immerse yourself in it a little bit i th well i don't i don't like use but i mean i think it's just sort of a hurt people culture is like mm. what i see like I, I think these people are trying to i try to like empathize now and i don't drink alcohol yeah like and i think it's just being in solidarity for this like hurt that i saw around me like if i have the privilege to casually use then i like ought not to right like and i think like are you talking about addiction like some people are, yeah yeah so i think the way that i've seen that people like come out of addiction at least in part and i know you're not supposed to talk about it but with like aa yeah um i mean it happens through sponsorship right and it happens yeah. through people that have been through it like hurt people hurt people healed people healed people right. you know so right. it's like i think that sort of healing happens through sponsorship and support and like solidarity and sobriety you know it's like these like s's so i think hmm. being a sober person it's like i want where i can to like be an influence of it in my friend group especially you know and like knowing and seeing some hurt you know and wanting that to sort of come out the other side like see these people that i care about you know and see a sort of isolated behavioral thing and trying to numb and and get through this pain yeah, yeah. with with a sort of drug use sure. or substance use thing, whether that's harder drugs or alcohol use or whatever it is. It's like just coping, you know. So Yeah. yeah. I yeah. He I hear that in your music as well. And uh that notion of uh expression but also coping. I feel like you you're singing in certain ways about that kind of stuff. I think it's from a very personal place. And, um, and I'm, I'm actually, the sound is kind of fascinating to me for a guy who you're like under 30. I'm curious about what you were listening to. I'm curious how you were drawn to this kind of hard, but melodic music. That's reminiscent of things that I experienced firsthand 20 years ago, maybe, uh, where did your music interests sort of begin and, and what sparked an interest in music for you? I think just like subversive sort of music and punk was like, I think I felt sort of this, like when normal was one thing to people, it didn't feel normal to me or something. And I think that's where I just landed on like a musical taste is like, uh, definitely community and finding that in punk um was it local punk or was it stuff you heard somewhere well in grade six or something protest the hero mm -hmm. was just up the hill from me i went to an elementary school called c.e broughton and they were going to anderson and they were called happy go lucky at the time right and they were like a sort of skate punk kind of group and then they put out some more melodic punk stuff and then they went like kind of full metal with another record but yeah. um I was kind of hearing them and kind of hearing like some like eighties and nineties, you know, stuff. And I think my space was happening at the time. Oh yeah. And right. Yeah. So I don't know. I was kind of just finding this stuff on the internet for the first time and just finding bands like refused and stuff yeah, yeah. that I was like, wow, what is this? Like, this is, this feels important. Right. You know, it feels more important and more like, speaking directly to me maybe than other stuff i'm currently hearing so i think i kind of like looked back and found a lot of stuff but they're also like heavy there's also sort of myspace era heavy 
the band the chariot like oh, yeah. there's some bands like that i think just resonated at the time too that i could see actually see live you know yeah. refused us gone at the time they're back now but did you see them on one of the i saw them on there i saw them five years ago or whatever when they them came at back the docks or whatever i was there yeah with off opening oh uh, yeah, yeah 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 i went to that trip yeah that's sick yeah it was good in the was, summer like around this time right Wasn't yeah it? what's the venue called now the reb rebel rebel club yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 so yeah they were good and it was good off were great so good yeah yeah it's so good show. so that's good you got to actually i feel like there's a phenomenon where younger people discover a defunct band mm. on the internet and then that band is maybe told hey for some reason like all your youtube videos all your whatever streaming stuff is just going up and up and up mm -hmm. there's this real it's like the new like how are we selling in this territory how is our record doing in winnipeg you know but it's like because of those stats i really think bands are coming back yeah because of people like you being like refused like i never got to see them but the records mean a lot to me and I just listen to them all the time. And I think that's weird algorithm is going back to the, it's strange. Yeah. Like you're basically, uh, you're resurrecting bands with your activity. Yeah. Which is interesting. That's cool. It's really cool. <laughs> I think, I, I think recently too, like stone roses, right? Yeah. Like that type of stuff too. I think it matters to young people and it sort of, it matters to people in England for sure. And they like do like, soccer field shows yeah, right soccer but, stadium shows yeah, yeah like but well i like i appreciate a lot of the people i talk to are obviously very dedicated musicians and dedicated music fans so i always appreciate people with a historical slant on things like there there's no the people i tend to talk to aren't a historical they're not ignorant of what's come before them you, i count you among them like you heard something and probably heard a band talk about a band or something yeah. and then you tracked it down yeah that's good yeah i think for sure that's good i think i want to sort of bring that stuff i think i want chastity to be so like visceral that it sort of ignores a lot of stuff and just goes for it yeah but i can't help but bringing in my influences obviously but i sort of think on a deconstructy level i want it to, to like live i want it to be like sort of internet era though at the same time right. and not sort of be this like resurrection like you know what i mean or this like no, this it like, sounds contemporary don't get yeah i hope so yeah. like i don't want it to i sort of don't want it to be this like 90s worship or something or yeah. this 80s worship like yeah. i sort of want it to be like just internet 2018 yeah like and Anything i want to be that like yeah um because i do love that and i love i think i love watching hip-hop recently is like amazing on the internet and it's like such a community on the internet yeah. that it's like unreal and hip hop mm -hmm. i think is doing it really well so it's like i think more of that would be nice if it was like just genre spanning a bit more you know yeah i mean but, you're making a music a kind of music i should say that is sort of at least on a mainstream level kind of out of fashion now it's sort of coming back maybe but like rock and roll guitar oriented music is still like people seem a little uh wary of it in some circles and other circles like it's the most vibrant thing still have you thought about that like the fact that you're making something that people would draw connections to stuff that happened 20 25 years ago but you're doing something fresh with it like obviously i think you are maybe already answered this this weighs on you a little bit like you think about that i think sort of but like i think my like commercial viability or like accessibility or something I don't mind I don't think about it too much or whatever but I think it is maybe with like attendance or like ticket sales or something like a bit more of an uphill climb than yeah. like a traditional like but I think both are important though and I like 808s like and I like you know what I mean I like that side of like if that's contemporary or in fashion well, or something it's, like it's hilarious to me on some level as someone who dabbles in some show promotion and watches other people in guelph do it because if you book a hip-hop show in guelph you'll have a way harder time filling the room than any rock band yeah it's just i mean that's maybe demographically what's going on right so but so you'd say it's in fashion it's weirdly not it's just that right. I, it's just i think there's maybe a racist undertone like i don't want to get too in guelph 
No, not just in Guelph. I just think I've noticed right. that even in Toronto, like it yeah. can be harder to sell a, a hip hop show than almost any rock show. It's just a harder battle, I think. Yeah. I mean, maybe le- it's less so in Toronto because there's more interest in the music there and it's such a hotbed of hip hop now. Yeah. Um, it has been for some years, but it's just something I've noticed like here it's riskier to do a hip hop show and, and count on anyone to headline a hip hop show. Well, yeah. Whereas like a rock band show, you'll you more than likely get someone out. Right. So get people out. So it's just it's just yeah. interesting. But yeah. you're right. The inter- the internet has shifted the way people operate and the way artists thrive, particularly in hip hop. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. So you'd like it's to like, follow that kind of model. I mean, you'd like to reach that kind of fervent community. I think so. Yeah. I think. And I see it though in this sort of guitar. I don't. I think like lines are so. I don't know, with the sort of millennial study talk or whatever. I think though that lines are get so blurred in yeah, a good way yeah, yeah. between genre stuff, and it's just like tunes. Like yeah, people totally. Are just like tunes. So it's like festival culture. Yeah, like the really eclectic festivals for like sure. Just make sure they are speaking to everything they can totally i think there's good and bad aspects to that totally and like playlist culture yeah yeah like yeah totally and just like shuffle yeah spotify shuffle culture and kids like myself included like just like come into it like and just like into finding things side by side you know like genre wise on my spotify shuffle or whatever i'm cool like it's cool so it's like I think it's like that anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So when Chastity started, did you record yourself? Uh, I've been recording the Sugar Shack. Oh, okay. I just so happened to be wearing this. Yeah. Sugar Shack Recording Studio in London, Ontario. Yeah. Okay. That's where you did? Simon LaRoche. Yeah. Okay. That's where you tend to record? Guy. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. just recorded some demos with him. And do you, what? Just writing. When you see, when people see Chastity, you're the lead singer. Yeah. So I wrote stuff with. I wrote this stuff with my friend Keegan Powell uh, and wrote some other other stuff and got into some writing with my friend Nolan. It's been collaborative, Nolan Matthews, and went and recorded this stuff with a group of people. Mm-hmm. Nolan and I like, met on the internet. Keegan I met from just playing shows and old bands and stuff. Maybe The Dungeon was one of them. Okay. And, and just got to some writing with this and stuff. And um, yeah, and then went and recorded like at the sugar shack with just a group of guys like i don't know if we'd played a show yet but we recorded three demos in one day like full songs just done and, and so put do, them you, out. do you play music like it's yeah, yeah yeah a bit i'm not amazing okay. at it so that's why i sort of collaborate and and get these others in the mix so what are your but primary like, instruments per se well my to be honest So I grew up in the church uh, and I was playing like brass instruments and sort of learned like theory in a sketchy way like there. Yeah. Um, And so to be honest, my... A sketchy way. Not a sketchy way in a religious way or something, but in a way that I don't really remember because I didn't care. And so my like primary, like I started playing like the euphonium actually when I was a kid and went to the trumpet and was playing brass and was taking piano lessons and... So I've done some writing on the piano and I've sort of converted that as much as possible to guitar. Okay. Um, but I sort of have these like bass or, or these like bed instrumentals um, and melody and lyric, you know? Yeah. And then my friend, and, and then my friend Keegan and, and Nolan and these others come in and, and we write stuff from scratch too. And we've like just gone and, literally in my bedroom as well, like worked on stuff for chastity. So it's like, it's pretty collaborative with these, with others and stuff who are in other bands and stuff and Keegan okay. in another project and Keegan's in LA right now working on some stuff. And, um, but it's been pretty collaborative, but, and these demos are just like a group of guys, like, and we just went and did it. And then we played a show like two months later or something with priests yeah, and then it DC? just like yeah, yeah, and then it just got sort of going from there. Right. Released like we didn't have any songs out, and then just got it going on the internet, and it started to sort of work with the support of like so many 
with Mark Pesci who put that show on and and people like that like getting it going. I mean, really wasn't on, your first show ever in your bedroom? It was. It yeah. would be? Yeah, it was. Yeah. And the nice. cops came? Yeah, there was yeah, it was like <laughs> It's pretty quiet in Whitby, right? Like, yeah. So if anything, like, out of the ordinary <laughs> is sort of happening, like, yeah, the cops were, like, out behind the house. But So why so do it in your bed? Because there was nowhere else to... Was there a... It's, like, sort of nowhere else to do it. Yeah. And I think, yeah, sort of nowhere else to do it. So that was the first... That was the first show. And then the first, like, show in a venue was the priests. Right pre-show two months later maybe right but just sort of started to get it going okay from there so the record is called death lust yeah and we talked a little bit about the harder aspects of europe or not your upbringing but your community your city your town whatever it is um and i and you we've talked a little bit about coping i'm just curious about that as a over the death lust as an overarching title as an overarching theme to the record what is that what does that term mean to you death lust in the context of your songs and this record i think it's just sort of an owning on like being or just like a recognition on like sort of this death obsessed thing and coming to terms with being death obsessed in ways and then like and then f- by owning it trying to figure it out like by recognizing it trying to figure out like is this your own obsession you're talking about or like a cultural obsession with it i think my own okay like just my own and and then trying to figure out my own sort of like this death fixation or whatever or death as an option um oh and then just though like trying to i mean by the end of the record figuring it out in a positive way i think and like rechanneling that sort of negative energy into a positive one of hopefully helping being a helping person and coping in the context of community and surviving sort of by that epiphany of like, let's survive this together or whatever, you know, like the song innocence on the record is like just about that. Like just coming back to bare bones, like innocence, and togetherness with people and feeling the weight of anxiety through that, you know, and then chains, the song chains is like sort of ends the record. That's like, okay, we're sort of outside these sort of chains of anxiety and we can choose, hopefully just like choose to live and to get like live together, you know? And so death lust. Yeah. I think it's like, it's like pretty, like the record isn't like fiction, you know, it's not like, and it's not like romanticizing that sort of idea of death. I don't think it's like just like straight up death lust. I have uh, in the last few months come to terms with the fact that I'm I'm basically suffering from anxiety and stress stuff. Uh, Have you experienced that? Yeah. Uh, Have you talk to people about it yeah yeah for sure yeah so i've talked to people about it as well yeah and tried to get some help with it because it's uh uh strange for me i just am used to plowing through my work and getting through stuff but i had some personal and family stuff had come up and uh it also has me fixated on health and mortality and stuff like that um i've never uh heard someone say so frankly uh you know, describing death as an option. Um, so that is, um, that's a, it's a difficult thing for me to process, uh, hearing you say that. Obviously that's, that's, that's something you've had to come to terms with. Yeah. I'm, and I'm sorry going through that. And I think, I think it's, I think I've just felt it as an option or whatever in my life and and felt it like at times louder than hmm. than others and just like trying to protect myself I think against the option you know and pr- trying to protect others against the option and um 
I don't know. I think, and I don't mean to be so frank, and I don't mean to promote it as an option. I think that's not like. I think it's sort of a bit the point of the record to just like. Well, I, I feel like you're saying it's the point of the record is the opposite of totally. That. It's not an option. It should, yeah, it shouldn't. Shouldn't be thought of as an option. I think yeah, it sort of should be. I don't know how to put it, but it sort of should be like recognized as an option so that it's not, there's this sort of. I mean, yeah, I would think you would want to recognize the inevitability of it. Right. That it's coming Eventually. at some point for all of us, but I don't think that's what you're talking about. Um, I think you're talking about it as a, a potential, uh, you know, final final uh final act kind of thing uh to alleviate pain um which yeah that's not something luckily that i've thought of but in the but in the midst of anxiety or stress you your mind goes to for me it's more about um protecting myself from that uh and wanting to make sure i'm not close to that option um but i can see how uh what you're describing is not that uh, necessarily it's it's the opposite of that almost like this is actually something that some people view as the ultimate healing mechanism yeah and or that's, way out or whatever yeah. but it's but the record helps you reconcile that uh, yeah i hope so and i think it's like yeah i was for a while like fixated on this one pool in Whitby, for example. And I talk about that on the record, like this one, just the option sort of of drowning, you know, and then there's sort of this epiphany in it of like winning against that and against that idea and just like sort of finding purpose and finding just a different path. Like you say on the record, on some level it offers or maybe I said it too, I can't recall now, but at some point the record offers some solution to that thought or some some way of keeping those kinds of thoughts at bay so that you don't view it as an option. But what helped you, just for people listening who might be engaged with this kind of thing, this topic, what kinds of things have you done in your life, either, 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 as, either as an artist or as a person, to to alleviate these feelings? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I think I think for sure like talking with someone I think politically I mean the access to therapy and stuff should be much cooler. Yeah, it's not like, it's expensive. It is and it's not just it's for a real problem uh, mental health and anxiety and stress. It's not something that you know, I know from my own personal experience, they'll tell you, you know, you got to go to counseling, you got to exercise, right. you got to potentially take some medication if that's not helping. Uh, that doesn't s- seem like enough. Right. But, and I don't know. Some of it helps for sure. Yeah. Uh, or you can, because you're m- mired in a psychological conundrum, uh, you can convince yourself it's helping. Uh, your brain's very powerful big time and uh and i don't think we until something traumatic happens i don't think we stop and think about that the power of our mind to right. help us overcome uh physical pain and and sort of mental uh suffering uh you i think there are the brain can change itself on some level that's i mean i've been reading a lot about this stuff in the last few months so i and everyone has theories um so i and i didn't mean to interrupt you but no, no, no. I think uh, you're right. Like, I don't think there's enough attention paid to how debilitating and serious uh, mental health is. I, I think we pay more attention to colds and fevers and flus, and that's tangible. Mental health seems almost intangible. Uh, some people would just say, well, just snap out of it. You know, it's not simple, though. Right. Yeah. And a lot of people, but I think there's like, I think the last like 10 years at least like just like the promotion that like mental health is health I think has been huge yeah like lately and I think like I don't know the first time that I heard of like an anxiety disorder it was too recent you know it's like yeah. too recent in my experience um 
I think like it's tough to put sort of a blanket statement on like a solution to it all like of course yeah. like but yeah. I think I think like uh serotonin is like such a real thing right and yeah. some there's like serotonin disadvantage like some people just like have a disadvantage with it and it's like like literally serotonin like happiness and like dopamine pleasure right yeah. these like things yeah. are chemical yeah so um medication in that instance like i think is important and it's yeah. like it is like i think anyone experiencing like stigma or something against that like in against like the idea of medication helping those disadvantages it's like that stuff i hope isn't is like like antidepressants is a big scary sort of thing or well, like serotonin. Mean, yeah it, it is like scary because it uh you, it uh there's enough discussion about how it can create or uh uh initiate ideation um you know actually promote negative thoughts and feelings and that's frightening uh you also hear many cases of people saying it saved them like it, it totally changed their lives right and it helped them function and got them over i've had a friend told me that he was taking something once and he, it felt like someone was artificially pushing him through his day so mm -hmm. he kind of got off of them because yeah. he just didn't feel like it was helping him but like i say other people will say it, it's for sure totally helpful and there are options i think within I think people like try different ones, right? They yeah. try a whole bunch to figure out which one works. Right. And, and I think definitely finding the care of a um, doctor or like yeah. a... And in cases where therapy is accessible, like I think there's some hope for that, that some people, you know, go through the education of it all and come out the other side a therapist and... I I'm, like and don't charge one hundred and fifty dollars an hour, yeah. or or yeah. like astronomical prices. And there's access to some of that, and online and in Ontario too. It's like there are those people exist in yeah. Hamilton and in Guelph and in these in Oshawa and these places, you know. Um, but definitely, we need to sort of like it's an issue like it's like a political thing for sure and we sort of need to mobilize together toward like vulnerable that vulnerability yeah out there and represent that as important and emphasize that like i think we all know someone right like we all know someone that struggles like yep. and we all struggle like so it's we could all use somebody to talk yeah. with like and yeah so i think it's like a huge missing part like the hope we're progressing toward like figuring out figure well figuring out pharma care yep and figuring out that like therapy is medical as well i hope we're figuring it out like i hope we're figuring it out i hope the states is i hope like everywhere yeah. is to to be honest like that these are resources that we should have in our communities it's like just like a doctor like just like a well i do think you you've invoked the the term political a few times and i i do worry like you're, you're saying you're i appreciate your optimism and your hope but i do think that there's a real assault on sensitivity uh and decency uh coming from i would say right word leaning uh people and uh and governments and administrations there's a sense that people have to tough it out and uh there's no so that worries me like when you have people who sort of have these platforms of like we're going to be tough we're tough you know we're macho we're not stop whining and complaining stop looking for handouts like that kind of stuff is generally aimed at people who need help of whatever financial uh medical uh, there's this sense of like, you know, past generations toughed it out. You can too. Stop complaining. Stop whining. And it's that's really frightening to me. It goes back to what I was saying about how some people might tell you to snap out of it when you tell them, well, I'm going through this mental health issue. And uh, so I don't mean to uh, counter your optimism, but it's just the reality that I 
face daily. Like I thought we were all moving in a great direction. And then the last couple of years in America, in Canada, like it seems like we're suddenly going not only it's beyond backwards. It's like time traveling backwards. Like it's way beyond the progress I thought we'd made. So sorry, that should have been, uh, uh, I should have let you have your optimism, but it is a fear of mine, a worry. Yeah. Of course, I should say I have anxiety. <laughs> so it manifests itself. Uh, the world isn't helping. When you have personal anxiety or you're dealing with stuff with your family, sometimes you can gain a, get some respite in the real world. And I, I this maybe is a nice segue into what performing and writing and chastity does for you. Do you view it as a cathartic thing? Do you view it as therapeutic in some way? I think it has that effect for sure. Like, and I think, yeah, I think it's just sort of a fruit off the tree of like doing it. Like, and I sort of hope if it can have the effect, you know, of like, of helping me, then hopefully it can have the effect of helping others. Like if there's not this access to this care, you know, then we have to find it in each other. So I think that helps in just like this sort of purpose not in this like virtue signaling sort of way or something I'd, sure but this like actual practical way of like okay we need to help each other and talk about it and talk about our health together like i appreciate so much you mentioning it and like i think it's just real and i think like i hope the progress is happening and just like this sort of infrastructure way where yep. we're safe and cool to talk about it. And as much as like safety is like, um, made fun of or something yeah. on the right, Sensitivity. it's like, yeah. it's like important and it's valuable to everybody. Yeah. And like, if they're, and I think mental health as much as like the right are fucked in their head. Yeah. Like, I do sympathize with anybody that hurts, you yeah, know? And yeah. I think, like, like anyone that says safety isn't important and that sensitivity sort of is wrong, it just sounds like they're sort of on the other side of information. Yeah, and yeah, On yeah. the other side of... Yeah. And I think, like, I think an effect of the internet... I think there's sort of an intersection that's happening with like information via the internet yeah. and this like frustration of like these systems aren't working or these systems are old or this way of thinking is old. Yeah. And I think like young people especially are mobilizing and the normal to these, like to young people is better. Yeah. I think, and I do have optimism with that. And I think the promotion of these important ideas I think are happening with young people and it's in the schools I hope and I hope the schools are going left like it's, I mean you have kids I, yeah like yeah they are I think that my son's school is quite progressive yeah and uh and I get that they, they talk about stuff not quite like this but they talk about um the way you treat other people a lot uh and and how your um actions and words can totally change someone else's day uh, and change someone else's life. So they talk about that stuff. Right. And I, 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 yeah, I should say too that you're right. I think there's a lot of optimism and hope to be gained from um, young people that, and their actions, which are, I think, vastly underreported in the media. We are stuck hearing about the, uh, the exploits of older white dudes, usually, who are soundbite they just like the they're often the kings of sound bites and it's all clickbait it's very frustrating like the media will report on that stuff more than the good stuff mm -hmm. and that fosters i think they know that by fostering a climate of anxiety they're going to get sensitive people to click on their articles and videos and right that's yeah that's more likely to happen with a negative story than a positive one and because anxiety people are drawn they gravitate towards the negative uh on some level i've learned that about myself a little bit too anyway no for sure <laughs> this is about uh your record and i think this stuff's all in there yeah 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 for sure yeah i was just thinking too like the right sort of in a clickbaity way has this obsession with fear yes it's all fear-mongering yeah. yeah and i think 
this obsession also with survival and you like the rhetoric that i hear is like just people worried about their jobs and yeah. you know if a union happens then this and oh there are we wouldn't exist if there were union and union people and all this right like this sort of fear and survival thing and other side of information like, that you said earlier is to- also important totally so i think once this is like i think anxiety and fear are related and i think like survival is such a mental health thing yeah, yeah. and it's such a like so i think it will become important to everybody and it should and this sort of resistance on the right to new ideas like the irony that in our country it's called progressive conservative yeah. and there's resistance to like women's issues and you know issues for people of color that like just vulnerable more vulnerable yeah. people you yeah. know it's like and they still ca- call themselves progressive or whatever it's like such a well lie it's a wolf in sheep's clothing yeah. like and the prime yeah. minister that we've got right now in my opinion is a wolf in sheep's clothing too yeah. with a lot of this stuff so um yeah it's a lie yeah it's a lie well this was a truly insightful and much heavier conversation than i thought we were going to have uh and just to bring it back to your work and this band like so you made this record what's next what are you going to do like do you have more songs yeah yeah I'm, i've been i sort of feel i like wrung the towel dry with this record you know and i've had time to i sort of got another towel going yeah. in a way you know and i think it's i've got some time i mean we're, we start touring and stuff for the record and then just touring for a bit but i've got some time at the end of august that i'm gonna be writing some stuff uh and just working on working on the next record to be honest but touring for the next i mean it's just about to start yeah. it feels like day one is about to happen for chastity to be honest like right. with this so it's like i'm day negative nine or whatever today you know right. it's like about to get going so yeah i think just playing shows for now well, a bunch of shows and going out with a band called morn from barcelona uh north american stuff first and just picking it up from there and going and doing it but yeah i appreciate you having me on and i've listened to the show for a while so well no I, I, sick, like. I appreciate that brandon that's great thank you for being on the show uh records out on captured tracks and royal mountain records right yeah so where where do you want to send people to learn more about it um just those labels yeah, just, websites probably or yeah maybe or just on instagram or facebook or wherever right. like uh it'll be all on there and uh yeah. Okay, that's cool. And what if we could play one song from the new album, what would you choose? Uh Innocence maybe or Innocence? Chains or yeah, uh, maybe Innocence. Innocence why yeah. why that one? It feels like the most important to me like um just the messaging and sort of signaling in it like yeah. it just sort sort of signals to that like resolve on the record i mean the record sort of does deep dive into like a dark place and i think innocence is dark too but it's real about surviving you know i think it's just like an important message to me and one that i hope to live by you know like it just speaks of hope and um and i've got it and i hope people find it you know and i i like i think that's why innocence anyway is okay important to me and yeah all right let's hear it this is uh innocence by chastity from the new album uh death lust uh brandon thank you so much for being on the show and being so open and frank and i i wish you the best luck with your band and everything going forward thank you so much for having me
Special thanks again to Brandon Williams of Chastity for appearing on this, the 411th episode of Creative Control, which is part of the Entertainment One Podcast Network and is available on all iOS and Android platforms and also on things like Spotify, YouTube, and Audio Boom as well. If you can't find an episode that you're looking for or if you wish to learn more about me and sign up for my regularly scheduled newsletter, please visit my website, vishkana.com. That's V-I-S-H-K-H-A-N-N-A. Dot com. You can like Creative Control on Facebook to keep up with the show. You can also follow us on Twitter at Vish Creative, or you can follow me at Vish Kana. Why not just like and follow all of those things? What what have you got to lose, really? I don't think much. Maybe. Maybe there's something. Time? You'll lose a bit of time. Still, you can also listen to a radio show version of Creative Control on Wednesdays at noon, Eastern Standard Time, around the world at CFRU.ca, or on an actual radio at 93.3 FM if you're in or near Guelph. And uh, thanks again to everyone who pledges to this show via our Patreon page. Please visit patreon.com slash creative control to make a flexible monthly donation and keep this podcast going. And in return, if you'd like a gift of some kind, please let me know and I will send perhaps a t-shirt or something to you. We'll figure it out. Just message me on Patreon once you've pledged. And I'd like to once again thank the in-kind sponsors of this uh, show, Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, Planet Bean Coffee, Granddad's Donuts, and Planet of Sound. If you'd like to look into uh, becoming an in-kind sponsor of the show, let me know. Send me a note. We'll figure something out as well. I'd like to thank my uh, old pal Jim Guthrie for letting me use one of his songs, The Rest Is Yet to Come. The instrumental version of that song uh, ends this show each and every week. You can hopefully hear it right now. JimGuthrie.org to learn more about him. And once again, thank you for listening to this show, reviewing it positively, rating it positively telling your friends about it and downloading episodes and subscribing to it. It means the world, and I will keep doing this as long as you keep doing that. And that's all I have to say for now. I will talk to you very soon. Goodbye for now.